Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is MVCT seminar, and today we are hosting Professor John Rogers from Northwestern University. So let me introduce. And so John got a bachelor degree from UT Austin, and degree and a PhD degree from MIT. Then he at the labs where working with uh, Jenang <laughs> and also the University of Illinois. Then in 2000, member, and he has he today he will talk about very things as neural interfaces. So let's welcome John. All right, great. Well, thanks for that introduction. It's been a real pleasure to spend the day with the, the faculty and the students here uh, at Stanford. It was really incredible collection of uh, research projects that I got to, got to hear about and really unique, uh, amazing people uh, as well. I look back at my calendar and I realized last time I gave a seminar here was 2019, then 2017, then 2014. I won't belabor, but every two, three years I seem to have an opportunity to come to Stanford and there's always so many new ideas that, that are being worked on and uh, you know, over time you realize you uh, develop this incredible network of uh, friends and, and colleagues and, uh, and people that you've had a uh, you know, fortunate opportunity to work with uh, over, over the years and so it was great to catch up with uh, Janan and Todd Coleman and uh, you know on, on and on here and uh, one of the things that, that that's a consequence of that is you begin to feel kind of old you know been, meet all kinds of like even undergrads who are my group back at Illinois now they're here as postdocs it's like who are you I don't even know and I like <laughs> meeting all these people I like, you know really really feel old and like worn out in some ways and, and you know halfway through the day then I'm meeting with Janan and she says at the end of our meeting is like have you started to think about how to plan out the final stages of your career <laughs> because that's what I'm thinking of well I am thinking about that but I don't want to think about it now so um, in spite of all of that you know it was a great great visit and uh, it's a real real pleasure to be here so uh, I know there's an incredible amount of uh, neuroscience research going on here uh, at Stanford many leaders obviously pioneers in this space and uh, you know, we've tried to co uh, contribute to that broader community from the standpoint of neuroengineering and so I put together a set of slides on different you know device platforms that we've built that uh, we think address you know important you know capabilities and 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 tool, tool me measurement uh, capabilities for, for the broader community, but we're really focused on the engineering. And why is that? It's because I like technology. You know, I'm a device guy, and that's what you're going to hear about. So brace yourself. This is engineering, uh, much more so than, than neuroscience. And um, I hope it doesn't come across as just kind of a smorgasbord list of uh, different technologies. I brought lots of uh, toys to pass around, and, and hopefully that will be engaging and, and fun for uh, for the audience, but, but maybe even important, more importantly, if you see any kind of technologies here that may be relevant for your research, let me know because all of this is being developed uh, for purposes of enhancing the science that's going on. And uh, you know, we're not in the business of publishing hero papers and then moving on. We're publishing papers on technologies that we really think have legs and the ability to uh, distribute in a meaningful way to the broader community. I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, as I walk through through the talk, but that's the context. So just ready yourself. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about uh, devices, and so I'll start with kind of a context of you know how we got into this space and a little bit of motivation, some of the uh, underlying concepts in, in material science, electrical engineering. But I'm not going to talk a lot about those details. Just assume that all of that kind of works, and I'll really kind of focus on on, on the consequences of, of all of that in in terms of uh, you know soft bioelectronic systems for for neural uh, in Interfaces and and I'll start a little bit of motivation. We we did a lot of work in uh, you know high density electrical you know interfaces to the brain, but with all of the uh, you know innovation and advances around optical 
methods, methods for neuromodulation and uh, sensing of neural uh, processes really shifted our direct, uh, research uh, around um, optoelectronics more, more so than, than electronics. And, and probes, filamentary probes and photometry, photopharmacology, uh, on and on. I'll, I'll go, go through a number of those different platforms. And then I'll kind of conclude with something that is a little bit more exploratory for us, but, but thinking about uh, interfaces not to uh, li live animal models for, for neuroscience research, but, but really thinking about spheroids and assembloids and, uh, and that type of uh, small scale uh, tissue, tissue construct. But you know, kind of the broader uh, view here is to think about you know, different ways to do neuromodulation, neural monitoring, uh, and thinking about you know, eventually the use of these technologies as electronic uh, forms of medicines. And, and there are lots, lots of uh, you know, great examples of success stories around uh, DBS and, and cochlear implants and so on, electrical platforms that are serving a medical function. And that, that's very exciting. If you think about the frontier directions, though, probably uh, one would like to move beyond just uh, small numbers of electrodes that, that interface with, with neural tissues with separated boxes of uh, you know, uh, control electrodes electronics to maybe different types of um, mechanisms for, for modulation. Think about electrical, but, but also optical. I think this is a very exciting field. A lot of the pioneering work has been done here at Stanford, but maybe combining optical, electrical with uh, pharmacological, chemi chemical, maybe thermal, mechanical, all kinds of different mechanisms you might be able to think about in the future. And, and do, do the uh, modulation uh, coupled with, with sensing you know, in some way that, that might allow for a closed loop uh, feedback control, so biochemical, biopotential, uh, you know, biophysical. Bio, uh, physical, uh, and so on, and, and where the uh, underlying uh, technology platforms that would enable these forms of modulation and sensing could, could have these kinds of characteristics. I think for us, this is how we, how we view, view future opportunities, like dramatically uh, miniaturized designs. You'll hear a lot about that you know, as I step through the presentation here, thinking about mechanics that match sur uh, soft neural tissues, so soft, stretchable mechanics. Janan's doing great, great work in this space as well. Maybe complex architectures, we'll talk about 3D. And all in the context of at least what we're interested in, fully implantable devices that operate battery-free with full bi-directional um, wireless communications, really a key feature. If it doesn't have that, then we're not working on it, I would, I would say, for the most part. So, so the, the, this is very, very important. I mentioned closed loop and um, maybe also uh, you know, systems that, that are built out of uh, materials that have a unique defining characteristic that they're fully bioresorbable. And so this is kind of you know, the set of activities that we have in this broader space. So thinking about flexible sheets and probes. Uh, so miniaturized electronic, optoelectronic components distributed you know, over areas along uh, penetrating uh, pins, for example. Uh, Bioresorbable is something we're very interested in. I just mentioned uh, that for temporary neural interfaces, probably maybe a little bit more relevant for ultimate uh, human clinical use, uh, but, but also may, maybe in, in a research tool uh, do domain as well. And then as I'll uh, present towards the end of this presentation, we're ex uh, interested in extending hardware device interfaces beyond point contact locations in the depth or across surfaces to full three-dimensional volumetric spaces. And so the question is how you do microsystems engineering in that kind of open 3D network topology is uh, some, something we find, find interesting as well. And so you can think about it as bioelectronic medicines. Ultimately, you'd, you'd like to you'd kind of move in that direction, maybe brain-machine interfaces. But everything I'll talk about today is really kind of in the context of research tools uh, for studying behaviors of small animal models uh, in, in neuroscience investigations, or as I mentioned before, in these small-scale spherical uh, uh, cortical spheroids and, and assembloids. And so the basic question is, how do you go from you know, man's most sophisticated forms of electronics, microsystems, technologies, to platforms that can interface with biology's most sophisticated forms uh, of electronics? Um, you know, the human brain, for example, ultimately representing an example of that. And uh, you know, in that latter case, you kind of think of uh, state-of-the-art silicon uh, CMOS. And so one way uh, to, to think about the challenge is how to overcome the geometry the mismatch, the mechanical properties that, that are dramatically uh, different by many orders of magnitude, gigapascals to kil kilopascals, geometry, 3D space filling from, from a platform like, like this, which is dense, multi-layer, planar, rigid, uh, and brittle. And one, one direction would be to think about alternatives to silicon and other uh, classes of inorganic materials to move down that pathway. I think there's a lot of promise in that direction. The, the other way is to think about you know, how to take a platform like this. It could be an integrated circuit. It could be a uh, you know, uh, a platform of optoelectronic devices, photonic integrated circuits, microelectromechanical systems, lab on chip type technologies, and um, 
figure out a way to sort of shave the active stuff off of the surface of the wafer, number one, and then slice it up into a billion tiny pieces that can be reassembled and heterogeneously integrated with uh, soft organic materials to retain the kind of function and the sophistication that uh, you know, is present in these kinds of technologies which support the consumer electronics gadgetry industry, but in platforms that can serve you know, chronic, uh, stable, but high, highly functional uh, neural interfaces. And so let's assume you can do that if you can create these ultra thin, very tiny pieces of uh, semiconductor material or fully active uh, devices. Why, why is that interesting? Uh, well, a couple, couple of things uh, follow from, from that type of geometry. One is the bending uh, rigidity scales down with the cube of the thickness. So you go from a silicon wafer, which is maybe a millimeter in thickness, to you know, a membrane that's maybe 100 nanometers in, uh, in thickness. That's a tremendous scaling in the uh, bending stiffness. So it really qualitatively changes the way you think of a material like silicon, for example, in this thin geometry is very flexible and floppy, much different than, than the way you would think about a silicon wafer. So that's number one. And then number two is uh, this is not a platform for realistic device is too thin and too fragile, so you have to think about bonding this kind of material with an underlying plastic or elastomer support, and then the question is how do you manage the interface adhesion between that inorganic high modulus material and an organic low modulus substrate, and there's thickness scaling comes to your rescue again because the energy release rate parameter G, which defines how readily an interface like that will open up and delaminate, scales down linearly with the thickness. So as these uh, material elements become thinner and thinner, uh, they become more and more flexible, and they kind of become easier and easier uh, to heterogeneously bond to dissimilar type, types of uh, materials. And so that's really just the background. I spent a lot of time on this. Obviously, this is 10 years ago writing this review paper. So the question is, how do you do that uh, you know, process of exploding these wafer scale devices into these very, very thin, very tiny pieces of material? And there are lots of ways to do that. I won't go through it. Here's an example of an extreme multi-layer epitaxial liftoff process which we grow by MOCVD layers of device-grade gallium arsenide separated by high aluminum content gallium aluminum arsenide. And that structure is interesting because the aluminum arsenide uh, will etch a million times faster in HF than the gallium arsenide will. So you just etch down through this, you lithographically define the lateral dimensions of these very small uh, elements, you expose the sidewalls, you dip it in HF, you eliminate the aluminum arsenide and then lift off the surface of the underlying epitaxial growth substrate, bulk quantities of device-grade gall gallium uh, ar arsenide. And so that becomes a scalable process to large quantities of very uh, high-performance active semiconductor materials. And so this is an example of what that looks like after you lift off the wafer and deposit down onto a filter paper. So you end up with very large quantities of, of these kinds of uh, material elements. And then I won't describe the details. It turns out the way there are ways to organize those tiny elements into um, you know, well-defined, precisely controlled arrays on pretty much any type of substrate you can, uh, you can think of at room temperature by using sort of printing type processes. We worked all of that out. I won't go through the details, but here's an example of sort of these wafer-derived semiconductor nanomaterials printed on plastic. And because they're very thin, because of that uh, downscaling of the energy release rate, you can put it on a piece of plastic, wrap it around a uh, cylindrical glass support without these uh, p material elements cracking or, or uh, flaking off of, of the substrate. So that turns out to be a really spectacularly powerful starting point for developing all kinds of very high performance inorganic hybrid inorganic uh, organic uh, optoelectronic electronic uh, systems. And so what, what can you do with that? I mean, the first uh, example uh, was, um, you know, think about uh, a very high resolution electrocorticography, so micro uh, ECOG uh, arrays. And this was a, an opportunity that uh, was brought to us by uh, Brian Lidd at University of Pennsylvania. We've collaborated with him uh, over the years. And I'll just cut to the chase because I don't want to spend too much time on the electrical interfaces because as I mentioned before, optical is a lot more interesting to us. But just to give you a sense of how far you can push those simple ideas that I just described to you in mechanics, materials, and manufacturing. Here's an example of a 1008 channel micro ECOG system, uniquely defined by an active uh, silicon based nanomembrane uh, backplane that allows for multiplex addressing a local signal amplification across this array. And this kind of uh, multiplex uh, scheme is the only scheme that will allow you to achieve really high uh, channel count systems uh, ultimately. And so that, that can be built on a very thin sheet of uh, polyimide. And you can um, mount that on um, 
various types of animal models. Like I said, I have lots of toys, so I'm going to start by passing this one around. So it's exactly that device you see it uh, in, in this uh, small, small box. And uh, we work with Bijan Passaran and uh, Jonathan Viventi to use this kind of uh, technology with non-human primates as an example of mapping uh, the visual cortex during uh, a visually evoked uh, response. And you can see the, uh, the channels and, and the kind of uh, resolution that's possible in that uh, mapping. Tremendous amounts of data at, at very high yields. Uh, two kilohertz sampling rates at each channel, thousand channels uh, with good uniformity. There's a few pixels that are dead. You can see that one's not working very well, that one, that one, but, but the yields and the uniformity extremely, uh, extremely high. So, so you can do quite, quite a bit in that space. And I think it provides a scalable pathway to not only higher channel count systems, but larger area systems as well. And this was just a demonstration of where things could go uh, over time, where we're not only printing silicon nanomembranes, but we're printing fully functional sil uh, silicon CMOS micro ICs. Uh, derived from uh, foundry-based uh, sources and SOI uh, platforms. He, he, here, each pixel includes a piece of CMOS that's about three microns in, in thickness and uh, about uh, 50 by 50 microns in, in lateral dimensions. So this is just an example. This is not fully interconnected and it's not tested on animals. Just show that the materials and the manufacturing, the mechanics concepts really scale to this kind of density. And the printing approaches allow us to adjust the uh, aerial coverage as well, maybe to anatomically match, um, you know, interest of uh, areas of interest in terms of uh, you know, spatiotemporal uh, resolution requirements in, in, in mapping. But, but that, that's really just context because as I said before, what we're really interested in is thinking about optical interfaces because again, of all the works that have been happening here at Stanford and all the vibrancy of uh, you know, uh, capabilities that, that rely really on photons rather than electrons. And I, I think that's, that's a much more promising uh, direction to go. It's just my personal bias. But, but we've been interested in that for a long time, not so much as neural interfaces initially, but thinking about advanced display technologies, what's coming after liquid crystals and organic light emitting diodes and quantum dot light emitting diodes, what's the ultimate? Probably the ultimate is, uh, you know, single crystalline uh, LED. Uh, based displays where, where the sizes of the LEDs are much smaller than the pixel area, but you can drive them at very high intensities and, and create a cost-effective way to a display technology that could beat performance parameters in any type, type of alternatives. So this is a while, while ago. We just showed that you could produce these very tiny uh, display type, type structures on thin, flexible uh, substrates. And, and over the years, we've sort of pushed that pretty, pretty aggressively to, to apply not only to uh, indium gallium phosphide, uh, LEDs, but ga indium gallium nitride as well. So you get um, you know all colors across the visible spectrum. This is an example of a very tiny tricolor uh, LED package. Each one of these is about cellular scale and dimensions, 10 by 10 by 1 microns, and then it's in a package with blue, green, uh, and red. In this case, it's sitting on top of a conventional LED that's uh, formed by wafer dicing, uh, to sort of mechanical properties, just to give you a sense of the uh, of the scale. And at this point, I think all major display companies uh, in the world have major efforts in and micro uh, LED display technology. So we're a com company of our own in that space. But, but I think this is the most sophisticated display uh, ever constructed because it's not only micro LEDs for the emissive part, we also have CMOS micro dye distributed across the back plane for, uh, for driving uh, the, the, the display. And, and my guess is that this is the future of display. This is the ultimate. I think Apple's uh, expecting to, to launch an Apple Watch based on this kind of technology in the next year or two and Samsung and others. So, so that's very exciting. But really want to talk about the relevance of all of that to uh, neural interfaces, of course, you know, we got excited about this, uh, you know, when Carl was doing his original work in, in optogenetics, he and I were on a defense science uh, council uh, research, uh, you know, gr group at that time, it was like 2008, 2009, it was just like, blew me away that you could, you could do some of the things that he was, he was doing and, and it really sort of enabled one to really contemplate interfaces beyond electrical stimulation without cell type specificity and all kinds of parasitics associated with dual heating and so on to something that would you know, allow you to use uh, light illumination to either excite or inhibit you know, neural activity and we're thinking, well, we have all these LED technologies. How can we contribute to that massive change in, in thought and, and uh, experimental me methodology in neuroscience research? And we took a look at 
what they were doing at that that time. And this is still standard, obviously. But but uh, you know, it it, did, it looked like there there was something that that we could maybe improve upon. And and the approaches were just using fiber optic cables plunged down into uh, regions of interest in the in the brain, just really uh, adapted from the telecommunication uh, uh, telecommunications industry and dental cement and so on. And that that sort of works. But but you know, it does uh, expose the the small animal to some mechanical load. Uh, some physical constraint. Uh, it makes it difficult to study social interactions because the animals kind of get tangled up in one another. It's hard to study them in moving in a naturalistic kind of 3D environment. So we begin to think, well, can we take these very tiny LEDs that we're originally interested in as a next gener generation display technology and sort of adapt them and you know, morph them into to a format that, that might be interesting uh, to, to the community and, and, and provide a way to, to leapfrog some, some of the disadvantages associated with fiber optics. And so that's where we got our start in this space, maybe 2011 or so, published the first paper in 2013. So this is kind of historical in a way. I'll move to you know, unpublished results here in a second. But, but anyway, we can, we can generate very high performance LEDs. Turns out to be very important uh, because you want to minimi minimize the, the thermal load on the surrounding brain, brain tissue. So, so you know, the highest performing uh, LED technology is what, what you want to use uh, in this case, as small as possible for reasons I'll get to in a little bit. But, but these are the kinds of LEDs that we can, that we can form. And, and sort of size scale reference to, to fiber optic cables. So you take these tiny LEDs, you can use those kind of printing and assembly techniques that I referred to but didn't explain very, very uh, well. But, but you can uh, bond them to a very thin uh, polymer substrate shaped in, a, in kind of a needle filamentary form. And then you end up with something that's so thin and so small, you have space for other stuff. So you can do micro, uh, you know, fo photo detectors, maybe, maybe electrode, temperature sensor turns out to be really important. You stack it all up, you still end up with something that ha doesn't have sufficient bending rigidity even to penetrate into the brain tissue. So, so then we use a releasable injection microneedle. It's a photodefined epoxy to provide the kind of structural rigidity that we need to insert these down into the brain. Uh, and then this gets released because we have a bioresorbable uh, adhesive, uh, leaving a fully formed optoelectronic system uh, in a uh, region of interest in, in the brain. And so I'll pass around this box. This is actually 10 years old, more than 10 years old. And I think you'll see these LEDs. I think maybe one is dead. You'll have to look, look closely. But, but for the most part, still working uh, in this type of geometry. So it's very thin uh, polymer substrate, uh, very flexible as a consequence. So we just threaded it through the eye of a needle, sort of wrapped it around the shaft to give you a sense of the mechanical flexibility. In this case, it's tied to a, uh, a radio frequency uh, energy harvesting unit that's operating at 900 megahertz. And that was the first embodiment. I'll come back to advanced forms of how you deliver power and control signals to these devices. But you can take a look at that. So the blue light you're seeing, I don't know if you can see the individual LEDs are quite, quite small, but if you squint, you might be able to see them. So this is the stereotactic insertion of that type of optoelectronic system uh, into the deep brain uh, region of, of a mouse model. So same kind of stereotact that you would use for uh, fiber optics, but now you're plunging LEDs, not just a, a waveguide. So you plunge it down. We uh, added some artificial cerebrospinal fluid in this case, dissolves the bioresorbable glue, pull out the injection microneedle. Now your system is down uh, in the brain. And then the electrical uh, interconnects come up through the cranial defect, and then you mount uh, the wireless uh, electronics subdermally on, on the surface of the skull. And I'll show you how that works in a second. But you might uh, wonder, and I uh, sort of mentioned the, the importance of small size and efficiency in terms of thermal load. So now you have like a light bulb, light source sitting in the brain. Like how do you prevent it from like burning up the neural tissue? We're quite uh, worried about that. So we did a lot of uh, in vitro studies and then ultimately in vivo stu studies uh, as well to understand the thermal load question. And uh, the reason why this works at all is sort of threefold. One is the LEDs are small enough that the surface area to volume ratio is very high. So you have an incredible rate of passive therm thermal diffusion. That's number one. Number two is that the efficiency is very high as well. These are state-of-the-art indium gallium nitride uh, LEDs. So you don't have a lot of wasted uh, ther thermal load as a consequence of that. The other thing is for optogenetic stimulation, the duty cycles are low. Uh, and so the overall load is, is minimized uh, as well. And then what we found is in, in uh, vivo, you have a flow of cerebrospinal fluid and blood that actually acts as a liquid heat sink. And so we could uh, look at the change in temperature. They have that integrated temperature sensor that I mentioned before. And you could look at the peak temperature uh, induced by operating the LEDs at uh, power levels that are relevant for optogenetic stimulation at 20, 10, 5, uh, and 3 uh, hertz. And uh, we can use the time dynamics and the peak temperature at 3, develop a full 3D finite element modeling 
uh, framework for the uh, thermal transport and then use those constitutive properties to predict what it uh, will look like at 5, 10, and 20. And so we think we captured the under underlying physics here and the peak temperatures are, are uh, you know, less than a factor of uh, 10 from uh, a damage uh, threshold. So you can kind of manage that <coughs> in that way. The other thing is because these devices are much thinner, smaller, and cross-section, uh, the glial response relative to a fiber optic uh, cable or metal cannula is uh, much reduced, as, as you might uh, imagine. And so this is kind of what it, what it looks like put, put together. So you have the LEDs down into the depth of the brain, soft interconnect coming up to a soft wireless energy harvester that also provides a control module. And so that's thin and soft and is um, low enough in profile that it can mount subdermally. And so now you have a, a fully implantable device that can operate indefinitely with wireless control uh, in a way that bypasses uh, all or at least many of the constraints of fiber optic type approaches. And then we worked with our collaborators just to show that all of that works in, in a way that one would expect through this place preference uh, training uh, experiment. But, but I won't go through the details of that. I'll just say, say it works. But, but now you have the ability to put LEDs wherever you want. There's not just the brain where you have this convenient sort of mechanically stable mounting location in terms of the skull, but you can put it in soft tissue locations as well, sciatic, for example, or spinal cord. You really mount uh, wireless LEDs wherever uh, you think they, they might be of interest uh, in, in you know, a neuroscience uh, protocol. So here's an example of one of those uh, wireless, uh, battery-free, fully implantable LED systems interface with the sciatic nerve. It doesn't seem to have any effect on the locomotor behavior, and we've quantified all of that, but just kind of an illustration that doesn't really affect the gait. Uh, or, or the mo mobility of the, uh, of the animals. The other thing you can do is now you can think about all kinds of different species. And so we've done birds, uh, bats, uh, snakes, fish, pretty much anything uh, because you don't have the, the, the tether and stuff. And so that, that's kind of interesting. And then you can do um, social uh, you know, neuroscience experiments uh, pretty easily. So here's a, a, a community of mice, each one of which has uh, an LED in their brains. They don't seem to notice. But anyway, they go around and do their usual mouse things. And they come over here, the LEDs light up and they chase one another and run around and, and do things like that. So, so it, it turns out that there are a lot of things, and again, this is not a neuroscience talk, it's a neuroengineering talk, I apologize uh, for that, but, but we work with you know, lots of different uh, groups who, who specialize in neuroscience, and uh, one of the things that, that we uh, did with Genia Kozowarski at uh, uh, Northwestern University is you begin to study social interactions and dynamics, and in fact, uh, start to use optogenetics to, to modify those interactions, so you can modify pair bonding interactions, you can form bonds, you can destroy bonds between communities uh, of animals. And I think neuroscience of the social brain is, is a really interesting uh, frontier area where you know, maybe technology can help kind of move, move the community in, in that direction. And so, so that's um, turn, turning out to be, be pretty interesting. A lot of the details are, are, are published there. But you know, if we're just limited to providing our devices to a number of collaborators that we can support directly, then I think the impact is fairly you know, modest. And what we would really like to do is open up access to these technologies to anybody who wants them, uh, pretty much. And so we put together a very bootstrap uh, company. We did a beta launch uh, at SFN in November uh, 2016, then opened it up to anybody who wanted to get access to these technologies into 2017 or something like that. And uh, about 350 systems deployed uh, worldwide at this point. I think 25,000 of these tiny implants. So just single use implants. And then there's an RF box and a software interface that allow you to do the wireless control. And I don't know if all 25,000 of those implants have actually been used, but, <laughs> but they have been delivered. Uh, and th those systems are uh, you know, at mo most, most developed countries around the world at this point. And I have a few of these. I'll just pass them on, just the implant part. Uh, and you might be able to light some up with your, with your phone. I think uh, the iPhone, the NFC coil is, is up here. And what we're doing is um, using uh, uh, magnetic inductive coupling uh, to deliver power wirelessly to these uh, coil antennas uh, that are present in these uh, devices. Pretty similar to what I showed you before, but not exactly the same uh, physics. But it, but it turns out to work really well. And you can uh, you know, get full coverage across a, a large cage uh, environment, 30 by 30 centimeters. You can send that up to about one by one meter with some tricks in, in terms of how you're multiplexing the antenna and so on. So, so that's kind of um, you know, what, what we're doing. Again, this company is not VC funded. It's not set up to make money. It's just uh, set up to, to reach a break-even point uh, so that we can uh, distribute these technologies. So, so um, 
most of what I'll talk about from here on is available or will soon be available fr from this company. If, if you're interested, I'm not selling anything, but if you're, if you're interested, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's there. So, so the good, good thing about, you know, running a research group, as many you know, faculty members in this room know, is you have really talented students and then they go off and do really cool things. And so I just wanted to highlight this because uh, former postdocs at the University of Arizona, another one at Na uh, North Carolina State University is sort of pushing this stuff, you know, uh, to levels be beyond kind of what we're doing uh, currently in the group. Group. And so this is a system that allows um, optogenetic stim stimulation, also dopamine sensing, with bidirectional um, you know, wireless link and a battery-free uh, NFC-powered pow uh, format. And they have a center tap on this coil that allows them to generate both positive and negative voltages. And uh, they have a silver, silver, silver chloride um, working in reference, uh, a, a counter and uh, reference electrode down here. And then they have a carbon nanotube base working uh, electrode uh, up, up there. And so, so you can do chemical sensing and, and many, many other possibilities uh, in, into the near, near future. It's a very powerful platform for doing all ki kinds of things and fully implantable as, as I described with, with the other technologies. So here's an example of measuring dopamine concentration right after administration of morphine. Uh, and they begin to decay a little bit. They uh, deliver naloxone and then it drops, drops back down uh, e even, even further. And so these are free moving uh, animal uh, experiments. But we've still been a little bit more focused on optoelectronics. So can you do detection? So you think about filamentary photometers to, to replace fiber optic based pho photometer uh, you know, interfaces for uh, you know, optically measuring neural uh, activity. So, so you can do that. So we have uh, micro LED. Now we have the, the micro scale uh, pho photo detector, uh, similar to what I described before. But you have a filter on top to reject the excitation light for responsive only uh, to the fluorescence. And uh, you know, without much change in, in the form factor, uh, quite, quite frankly. Electronics get a little bit more complex uh, because we're doing data transmission. Uh, as well as uh, your know, power, power control and, and power, power harvesting, but, but you can do all of that. And this is an example of an animal that's been implanted with one of these uh, pho photometers. And so, um, I don't know if it's gonna play. Anyway, there's not much to see there. It's just walking around and, uh, uh, oh, there, there we go. So, yeah. Not super exciting, anyway. <laughs> That's what they can do. But, th but then you can do both. So you can do wireless photometry together with optogenetics. So in this case, we had two LEDs, uh, one to stimulate the fluorescence, one to do the optogenetics, and then we have a photo detector with a narrow band, band filter uh, on top. The electronics start to get a little bit more complex here, so we knew, move it to a back subdermal mounting location, uh, and you know, we don't have any problems with that. And, and the people who've used these devices, our collaborators, haven't any, had any problems with that uh, either. But it opens up area for additional uh, electronics components. And one of the important things here is now we're using Bluetooth technology, uh, and there's the Bluetooth uh, antenna. And so that vastly increases the data rate and the computational resources that, that are on board uh, the device, as, as I'll describe uh, in, in, in a second. Uh, the power harvesting starts to get a little bit more uh, complicated, and you have to worry about electromagnetic inf interference associated with the uh, uh, high-frequency uh, RF that's powering the device, and then the uh, Bluetooth uh, wireless communication. But you can ma manage all, all of that, and, and that's ki kind of what it looks like. This is all unpublished, by the way. So this is an example of this new uh, G-CAMP uh, indicator, and here we're measuring uh, fluorescence. Uh, and we have uh, you know, the system programmed to, to pulse the uh, fluorescence excitation with this type of time, uh, uh, time profile. And then we have optogenetic stimulation at 628. And so we can see uh, expected you know, increases and slow decreases in, in fluorescence in uh, intensity associated with this, uh, this G-CAMP uh, indicator. So anyway, some, some things that you can, you can do. Uh, and just continuing on, I hope this doesn't start to get tiresome a little bit, but additional functionality. Think about microfluidics also added straight on, on top of these uh, plat platforms. And I'll pass around a device of that type. So in this case, we have four separately controlled reservoirs with uh, uh, electrochemical pumps. And we have uh, soft microfluidic systems uh, co-integrated with the optoelectronic uh, filaments. And so now we can do optogenetic pharmacological modulation at the same time, and we can play those uh, two, two effects off of one, one another. Now, the problem here is that you have some kind of volume constraint associated with how much drugs you want to deliver uh, into the brain. So it's difficult to make this fully implantable, but it's a fairly low profile kind of head cap, essentially, is, is what it is. Uh, and there's the f those are the four reservoirs. And like I said, we're using an electrochemical mechanism to trigger the pumping action. And then each one of those res 
reservoirs connects to a separate channel that runs along the length of the uh, shaft and the uh, drugs emerge at the point where the uh, LEDs are, are located. And so again, you can do you know, social experiments uh, without, uh, without the wires and without uh, you know, much, much load on, on the animals. Is that, that's kind of what it looks like. So you can begin to put all this together. You think about like you want to do uh, bilateral stimulation, drug delivery, you can do that also. So here we have a couple of drug reservoirs. We have pairs of uh, you know, penetrating filaments so we can go on both sides of the brain. LEDs, multiple colors, multiple drug reservoirs, all kinds of uh, you know, different options here. Back, back to the NFC uh, type control system. And uh, here's an example of some experiments that we did with Genia's uh, group. Depending on the, uh, which si side you're on, you can spin them right, spin them left, or you light them up on both sides and then you know, they don't spin at all ty type of thing. Uh, and then you can do um, your delivery of uh, uh, viruses at the location of the uh, optogenetic stimulation. So you don't have to worry about uh, you know, get, getting to the same spot. You just use the microfluidics to deliver the viral vector, and then you do the optogenetics uh, at the same location. And of course, you can do uh, social experiments. The other thing that we're quite interested in is this whole field of pho photopharmacology. Again, you know, what can we do as an engineering group to kind of control, contribute to that space? And this is an example of a caged uh, glutamate species that can be uncaged by exposure to, to light. Uh, and so this is just a first stab in that kind of direction of uh, photopharmacology. But there's a lot of other things that we have kind, kind of in, in, in the works. And so uh, you, know, you can do, do this kind, kind of thing uh, as well. And so I'm going to conclude with device technology of this type with the final one, which is kind of our Swiss Army knife. This is uh, you know, the, the most functional, I guess, system that we've uh, that we put together. It's still impressed. But, but this uh, allows us to do EEG, EMG, and two optogenetic stimulation sites. And also it's a precision temperature sensor down here and a pair of drug delivery uh, reservoirs uh, down here. So postdoc kind of got carried away with this thing. <laughs> but anyway, it works. And so it's uh, you know, back subdermal and it's Bluetooth and uh, wirelessly powered, fully implantable, you do social experiments and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, that, that, that's pretty interesting. We're working with folks at the Army Research Lab to do sleep studies. There's how you have EEG, EMG, at temperature, you can look at circadian rhythms. And really, the, the amazing thing is even at these very low signal levels that, that you're measuring, you know, EEG, in the context of this extremely high electromagnetic noise field associated with a wireless power delivery. If you're careful around noise cancellation, you can achieve um, your performance in wireless EEG that's really indistinguishable to, to the best of our ability uh, from uh, a tethered, uh, you know, wired-based uh, setup. Uh, and so, so that, that, that's pretty good. And, um, you know, we can do all kinds of uh, sleep studies and we can d identify sleep stages and we can see the temperature uh, variations also track EMG uh, as well, as, as I mentioned before. But uh, just to kind of uh, conclude, uh, you know, back to displays. So you can think about filamentary probes. We got started in 2D arrays for, for displays. And, and, you know, what, what could you do in that context in terms of neural interfaces? And now you can do 2D arrays. Uh, independently controlled uh, LEDs, so it's like a light display, though. But but now, you know, integrated on onto the surface of the of the brain, and that's what's being shown here. So just un un unpublished stuff, but you get a sense of uh, what that what that looks like. So they're running running there, and we have it open just so we can see what's what's going on, and and you can pro program this uh, in in real time. And so again, battery free and 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 wire wireless. So let me uh, kind of shift gears for, for the last part of the, the talk and uh, describe some different sort of sorts of technologies and, and platforms and uh, you'll really come back to this idea of complex architectures. And maybe check that box to some extent. That one talked about that. Uh, closed loop, we've done, done a lot of that. I didn't say anything about that. But let me come back to this uh, question of 3D. So this is closed loop, by the way. So it's optogenetic control of overactive bladder. So we have a wireless communications module down here. Strain gauge on the bladder. We can measure uh, filling and voiding of the bladder. And then we have an optogenetic uh, uh, interface to the bladder to silence uh, voiding in periods of overactivity. So anyway, you can do all of that sort of uh, closed loop, in this case with a biophysical sensor. But re really what I want to talk about for the last uh, 10 minutes here is this 3D uh, interface, and and it com comes back comes back 
to this. And, and, and the question really is, how do you go from these you know, dense multi-layer microsystems technologies that are so well developed to something that geometrically resembles you know, maybe a neural circuit with kind of open mesoscale uh, 3D framework, or you know, it's a pretty common uh, ubiquitous design feature in, in biology, vascular networks, cytoskeletons, all this kind of stuff. So talked about curve compliant, but, but this other kind of three, 3D you know, framework uh, type, type design is something that you might aspire to from, from a standpoint of engineering. And so the question is, how do you go from this to something that looks roughly like that or like that? You know, how, how do you do that? And we've been thinking about that for some number of years, quite frankly, and uh, almost thought, you know, at some point it's impossible to it configure the wafer so I could flip a switch and then all the functional stuff would kind of spontaneously move up out of the plane in kind of a predetermined engineering 3D framework. Like, could, could you do that? And uh, that seemed like it was going to be really hard, but then it turned out to be really easy. And I'll uh, show you how that, that works. And I'll pass around some samples and stuff. So, so what you do is you um, start with this wafer, shave all this stu active stuff off of the near surface. We already know how to do that. I talked about the flexibility and the bonding and all that. You do that, but not as a uniform, uh, uniform sheet. You lithographically pattern it into some type of geometry. You flip it over. You can uh, chemically functionalize sites on the back side of that 2D mesh so that it will bond very strongly to a pre-strained piece of uh, silicone elastomer. And then if you release the pre-strain, what happens is um, you know, the compressive forces that get imposed on that 2D uh, filamentary network precursor cause delamination of that structure from all of the regions that aren't strongly bonded, those, uh, you know, uh, away from those lithographically defined chemically functionalized reason, regions. So here's an example of what happens if you do that. So here's the precursor. It's an array of these filamentary serpentine structures along this direction, along that direction. It's bonded to a biaxially pre-strained piece of silicone rubber. And then if you release uh, the pre-strain, pre it goes from um, it goes from 2D to 3D. So then, then in this case, the 3D, the array of coils running in this direction, and then another array of coils sitting on top of the first oriented orthogonal to them on, on, the, on, the, on the top uh, part of that uh, framework. So this can be done with really any kind of planar device technology. So it's a generalized approach to go from 2D to 3D, any type of microsystems technology you can think about. So this is uh, silicon. See the bonding sites here? Uh, that's you know structure made you know without defects. This is pretty straightforward. You can uh, look at that in cross section. It's not quite a neural network, but at least resembles something like that and kind of headed in that direction, I guess. Overall, from a geometry standpoint, is this device grade monocrystalline silicon could be populated with devices. It's not. There's just the material structure, and this is a, a polydimethylsiloxane uh, substrate. So I'll pass around. Uh, a box. Unfortunately, the battery is almost uh, dead. The device is still, still quite quite nice. So this is an array of silicon mesostructures like this, but all kinds of different geometries in a full array on one large uh, silicone su substrate. And the 2D to 3D is done in one shot. So all of those grow up out of the plane in, in a single uh, process. And I don't think there are any defects in, in those structures that I'm passing around um, you know, right, right now. And we just made them big enough so you can kind of see them. They can go much smaller if you're interested. So what, what good is this for, for neural interface? Well, one thing is you could think about this maybe as an active electronic scaffold around which you could grow neural networks in their kind of native 3D geometries. And we're very interested in that. But let me just talk about something a little bit different, which is trying to configure soft three-dimensional interfaces to organoids, specifically uh, cortical spheroids, you know, in the context of uh, neural. And uh, this, this, to me, is very exciting. We're not involved directly in the biology, but you can take human stem cells, as you know, you differentiate them, you can grow them into small-scale organs of various types, and uh, small-scale brains are, are pretty, pretty cool, pretty interesting. If you take those uh, 3D structures, though, it's very difficult to do any kind of electrophysiology on them with a traditional 2D multi-electrode array, because the geometry mismatch, obviously. And so the question is, could we use the, these kind of buckling-induced 3, 3D transformation process to gently wrap a 3D organoid like that with functional devices, electrodes being the simple example of that, but LEDs, other things as well. So it turns out that, that that's, that's possible. So here's an example, sort of multi-layer, multi-functional structure. You see the bonding sites down here. We put that on a biaxially pre-strained substrate and pop it up into this geometry. It's all guided by finite element modeling, so we know what we're doing a priori. In this particular case, it creates these, uh, this collection of ribbon structures that form a basket that's geometrically matched to a cortical spheroid of interest. 
And we can throw any kind of devices into this framework. So an example of microelectrodes, microscale LEDs, talked about that previously, heaters, temperature sensors, electrochemical sensors, and so on. So, so that's uh, what it looks like. I have a couple of these devices I'll, I'll pass, pass around now. There's one part of this that kind of rattles around, so don't shake it too vigorously. <laughs> just I keep it not super fragile. It's not one of a kind or anything like that, but just my students will get pissed at me if I bring back a broken device. So anyway, so, so then you have this, um, this 3D structure. Um, you know, how do you get the, uh, the spheroid in? Well, it's all reversible. I mean, it's just linear elastic buff buckling mechanics. And so all you do is just locally deform the underlying elastomer substrate and open it up. And you can do that. Uh, and this is kind of what it, what it looks like. You locally open it up, drop your spheroid. This is all finite element modeling, by the way. It's not just cartoon. This is quantitatively accurate in terms of the physics. Drop that down in. And this is what it looks like top-down optical micrograph. There's the cortical spheroid, human stem cell derived. There's the uh, ribbon structures, with el just electrodes in this case. And uh, you can see it gen gently uh, wrap, and everything is modeled out. So we're not imposing you know, any significant mechanical stresses on the outside surface of that very fragile uh, tissue uh, system. So, so that's what it looks like. You can do arrays pretty, pretty easily. Uh, all the spheroids are a little bit different sizes, and maybe you want to do you know, multiplexed arrays. You can certainly do that, because as I showed in the sample that's pass being passed around, this is an assembly process that happens you know, all at once across large areas. So there's no problem problem with that. So here's uh, you know, some initial uh, results that we've done. This is an uh, example of electrophysiology across the 3D surface of one of these cortical spheroids uh, just to see uh, you know, what's, what's possible. There's enough open space here. You can also do optical imaging simultaneously. It's probably useful to do that. But here's sort of a random uh, firing pattern uh, rendered across the uh, 3D surface of that of that spheroid. So any, anyway, just initial proof of principle, what, what you can do. But because the uh, techniques are, are fairly generalizable, you can begin to think about these frameworks not only as sensing interfaces, but also geometrical constraints for forming deterministic assembloids. So you can take two of these spheroids, create a framework that holds them adjacent to one another, uh, and then you can hold them in that position and do electrophysiology while a neurite bridge forms between them, which is typically what will happen spontaneously. So here's cortical spheroid A, B. You can watch the neurite bridge form by optical microscopy, but now you can look at when that neurite bridge becomes functional because it will lead to coordinated firing of electrical activity in A and B. And you can pick that up with arrays of um, electrodes. And so, so you can do that. You can watch that neurite bridge form, uh, but then you can also come in with a scalpel. You cut it and you watch it reform. And so there may be some interesting capabilities that emerge from this in studying processes of neuroregeneration, uh, for, for example, maybe traumatic brain injury, damaged peripheral nerves, that, that kind of thing. So you can extend this out, and you can think about more complex uh, assemblies, not just pairs of spheroids, but how about three? You can do that. It's no problem. As you begin to stick, stack these things up, though, however, you need to worry about uh, you know, uh, the formation of a necrotic core because everything there's no vasculature, and so you have to worry about you know, diffusive transport of cellular waste and nutrients in and out of this structure. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it turns out that all of these ideas that I just described to you apply equally well to microfluidic systems. And so you can begin to uh, develop vascular trees and structures with channel dimensions that are very comparable, even smaller if you want, uh, than uh, capillary beds. So um, you know, something I think is outside of the scope of 3D printing, for example. So this is a 3D uh, network. I'll pass this around. It's a little bit larger than you would ultimately want, but this is something that, that we're doing. And there's some electronic components integrated. So you can combine fluidics with, with electronics, optoelectronics pretty, pretty easily. So let me um, kind of head to a conclusion here and give you a sense of um, what we think might, might be interesting. So this is a, a slightly different framework. Instead of studying electrophysiology, we're studying mechanics, in particular mechanics of muscle rings. And so this structure is designed to mount a muscle ring here, and then there are strain gauges uh, that, that uh, sort of populate the sidewalls of that structure. So we can watch you know, contraction of uh, muscle rings. This is what it looks like uh, in side view. The muscle ring goes right here. There are the strain gauges. Uh, here, and this is all modeled out so we know exactly how forces will change the resistance of these strain gauges, and we can back out contractile forces uh, from that. And we can look at you know, the response of these muscle rings to various kinds of uh, pharmacological agents or you know, optogenetic stimulation. I won't go through the, those details, but these are the kinds of uh, things, things that you can do. And it really sets the stage for what you know, I personally think is really interesting, is using organoids to study 
uh, neuromuscular junction formation. And this is something that, that people have looked at uh, before. You take a neural uh, spheroid and, and a muscle spheroid, for example, you bring them close together and then you watch that NMJ form. Uh, but you know, if you're only doing it by microscopy and 2D you know, multi-electrode arrays, you're you're missing a lot of um, you know, important uh, biology there. And so, so this is an example of a structure that we put together for that opportunity. And I'll pass one of these around. It's like 2D precursor and then the 3D geometry sitting right next to it so you can get a sense of what that looks like. So what we're doing here is we have a basket here for the, um, the neural spheroid. And then we have one of those supporting framework structures with the uh, strain gauges in integrated for the muscle ring. And they're close enough to one another that that neuromuscular junction can form and we can watch what happens to the electrophysiology and muscle contractions as that junction begins to form. So kind of like the pair of uh, spherical uh, or cor cortical spheroids, but now in the context of a uh, uh, NMJ. And so the devices that I just passed around are exactly this, and that that's kind of the layout. And so so we're pretty good at this uh, at this point. I try to give you a sense. Like you start with a design, you get the 2D electronics, the 3D system, and maybe a couple of weeks, so, something like that. So uh, again, not not hero uh, experiment stuff, but but very you know, re routine and, and uh, repeatable and this kind of finite element modeling uh, framework for understanding how this geometry transformation works is absolutely essential because you do a lot of the modeling up front before we do any experiments and that, that turns out to be really important. So anyway, I think that's it. Uh, I'm about at the end of my time. So I'll just uh, conclude by you know, sharing uh, and summarizing some of the things that we've been thinking about and working on space of neuroengineering for the purpose of neuroscience research. I mean, ultimately, none of this stuff matters unless people are actually using it. And so, so that, that's kind of the main motivation. I talked a lot about these optoelectronic filaments. All kinds of things are possible here. I just gave you a, a sense of the possibilities. Many, many other things as well. And uh, we think these kind of 3D functional frameworks are pretty cool also. And uh, we're spending a lot of time on that. So I'll just go ahead and conclude by acknowledging senior collaborators. We work with a number of different folks in engineering science. Young Gong pro uh, Wong probably uh, most prominently. Uh, one of the world's best computational mechanicians. I think we published maybe 400 papers with Young Gong. It's incredible. So he should be uh, on this list like five times in a row or something. <laughs> but anyway, a lot, lot of other great people, former postdocs and stuff, doing, doing their own thing. I try to highlight that a little bit. Uh, but it's really that neuroscience interface. And uh, you know, we leverage very strongly through Neurolux, but you know, we work uh, very closely with individual groups as well, primarily uh, you know, th those at uh, Northwestern these, these days, but others also. So those are the senior collaborators but the uh, students and the postdocs, as uh, many, many former students in this audience right now <laughs> know better than anyone, they're, they're the most important people. I just get to talk about this stuff, really talented uh, you know, individuals, creative, hardworking people. This is a picture from a, a holiday event, so it's a re really diverse, uh, powerful uh, team. Although this makes it a little, look a little bit bigger than it really is, because this is kind of friends and family. That's not a postdoc. <laughs> Uh, and that, that's not a grad student. So anyway, thank you, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, John, for the wonderful talk. So now it's open to questions. So if you have any questions. Is it okay? Working. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was uh, very, very, very impressive. Uh, I am actually very curious about your last uh, slides showing uh, 3D, uh, like and especially 3D organoid work. Uh, like these uh, baskets, they still make an appearance of being semi-rigid. Uh, have you assessed uh, how much of uh, organoid ingrowth happens, and does organoid pushes these boundaries away? Does it somehow affect it? Uh, it's physiology. We're looking at mature spheroids, so they're not continuing to grow for the most part. They've, they've matured out. There's a fixed size, and we slot them in. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned several times, we have full quantitative understanding of all of the mechanics of how these things work, including the bending stiffness of those filamentary ribbons that come down and make contact with the 
with the organoids. And as you know, they're super low modulus, super fragile things. You cannot push on them, and they just deform immediately. So, so the, the, the ribbons need to be in close proximity. They don't necessarily need to touch. I think if you get them within maybe 10, 20 microns, close enough, because the you know, surrounding cell media is ionically conducting uh, anyway. So we typically don't try to push on them or design these structures so that they don't push on them. The other thing about these is not totally obvious. I don't know when you look at the samples. These are very, very thin films. Um, they almost look kind of rigid when you're looking at them you know, in, in these micrographs and you're looking at the simulations. But you know, they're typically a half micron in thickness. They're absolutely like wisps almost of, of material. Uh, and so, so there's not a lot of stiffness there. Even if they do come into contact with the organoid, they tend to buckle and bend themselves before imposing large forces. But it's a really important question, and it's something we've thought, thought a lot about from a modeling standpoint, thinking, th thinking through these kinds of issues. But the, uh, the final thought I would say is I think the growth process itself offers a, offers a pretty interesting opportunity to begin to embed these structures within the uh, organoid, and that's something that we're working on now, very, very thin microfluidic structures that are seeded with the cells. And as the organoid grows, it naturally incorporates these channels you know, within the uh, organoid. I don't have results to share uh, with that uh, on that yet, but, but I think that's, that's kind of a way to take advantage of, of the growth in terms of kind of embedding the functionality within the depth of the structure. Yeah. Uh, always enjoys your talk. So, all the uh, the um, organoids. Uh, do you do any special surface treatment, surface um, uh, kind of modification to make it? These because per. Yeah. Thanks so much for your talk. I'm just curious, considering the small size of the optogenetic implants, and what sort of benefits you see by way of reduced tissue damage, and as a result, over longer time frames, whether you see reduced um, or less reduction in stimulation efficacy, uh, result our tissue, for instance. Great question. Reason why we've kind of migrated. Transport interface. So that's. heard in other people, Charlie Lieber. Penetration through, you know, development of
so Nutrients and stuff, and then they would start to grow, and they would become these complex connected circuits that um, essentially and so about. <laughs> the idea of a grow growing a brain, that, that was the question. Can, can technology help with that? Maybe. How long is my career again? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a grand challenge. That, that's a great kind of aspirational goal. I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing way to fr frame it, you know, how you, how you grow a brain. Um, and, um, yeah, I think think one could kind of work work toward that. Maybe there are technology components here that would ultimately be relevant for that type of goal. And uh, I guess we have a lot of the piece parts and building blocks. And you know, there are other people who do you know direct write like three D printing of different types, of cell types, and trying to create or organs that way too. And maybe these technologies could play a role in in, in that direction. Uh, but it's not something that we're working on specifically, I would say, uh, because there's some lower hanging fruit and we can, you know, accelerate the broader community extent that we can is kind of where our focus is. But I, but I love the, I, I would love to be able to do that. And like I said, may, maybe we could contribute a little bit in that direction. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I would say the different things kind of on a on a linear filament, and um, we can illuminate we can illuminate and we can detect light from tissue directly adjacent to that filament. But I think Carl's group, other groups at Columbia, that you, this idea of like holographic projection and really manipulating and controlling photons. Right now, the LED is just spewing photons everywhere, and they're just scattering in a totally you know, uncontrolled way. And would there be ways to use maybe metasurface type optics that could be integrated with the LEDs to shape the illumination profile and maybe ultimately allow that to be tuned in some way? that would be equivalent to what's being done with large bench top a apparatus uh, currently in other labs. You know, if you could figure out how to, how to do that and, and not only deliver light through volumetric spaces, but also sense it as well. Is there some kind of two photon or confocal equivalent that you could figure out, you know, how to, how to miniaturize in that way? And I know Mark Schnitzer has done some really great work with grin lenses, so maybe there's something there with endoscopics and, and, and that sort of thing. I don't know exactly how to, how, to, how to get there, but that, that's where I think the future is, is going beyond just the light sources and the photo detectors to optical systems that can really control the, uh, the broader you know, illumination field. Yeah, I, I think that, that would be an exciting direction to go. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I could go into the details. It's sort of, you know, engineering recipes. We use um, ALD uh, and Paraline, uh, both providing good conformal coverage. Uh, but typically only after we've somewhat planarized the electronic components. There's tons of topography there and sharp edges that can be problematic. So we planarize that with a uh, polymer material that's not meant to serve as a water barrier, but to just sort of round out the, the sharp edges and then use conformal deposition techniques for, for these devices. And that, that tends to work. But, but if you notice, you know, all of the electronics sort of packed in you know, a relatively small kind of manageable uh, area. If you take a look at um, you know, those uh, micro ECOG sheets that I mentioned before, they're like orders of magnitude more challenging because now you're talking about you know, macroscopic areas, one of the devices passed around. Um, and and you, have to, you have to seal the top of this thing. It's actually um, capacitive sensing is what we're doing here. You have to seal the top of this thing with no defects whatsoever because if you have one defect, Biofluids immediately go through that defect. They short out the back plane. You get leakage currents. It's damaging the surrounding tissues, and you corrode your electronics. So it's absolutely defect in intolerant is a problem. <laughs> and uh, you know you need to seal this thing with um, some kind of water barrier that's not only defect free, but um, it's also not permeable to water and is not you know being resorbed in, in biofluids o over time. And so here, what we use is a um, we grew uh, therm thermal oxide on the surface of a silicon wafer, and then we have ways to lift it off and transfer. It's basically using the same schemes I mentioned before to get the silicon over here. We do the same thing with the silicon dioxide. We seal the top surface. That was the only strategy that, that we could come up with that, that really works. So we've, we, we struggle with that problem about half a, half a decade or so. And uh, you know it's just like impossible. Because if, if you do anything uh, from the standpoint of deposited uh, coatings, uh, you know, defects are uh, in inevitable because you have a surface topography here, but you also have heterogeneous surface chemistry. And the nucleation and, and growth rates are, are different depending on which region. So we were never, somebody might be able to make that work. Uh, we were never able to do it. So we try to separate the growth of the water barrier from the electronics and then physically bring, bring them to, together afterwards. Uh, and th this works. And you, you can do it, do it in, in very thin layers. Go, go thinner. This was nine, 900 uh, na nanometers. But it needs to be thin because if it's not thin, then you lose all the mechanical flexibility. So that's the other constraint. It has to be submicron in thickness, free of defects, perfectly impermeable to, to water. And that's, that's really, really hard. And so. It's another reason why I didn't want to work on these systems anymore. <laughs> so I do the optoelectronics a little bit, a little bit easier. But uh, but that was the solution. We published a couple of papers on that. I think it's a, it's a workable approach, but it's uh, brutal for the grad students and the postdocs to get that to to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. So we're, we're just using um, standard electronics conventionally you know, applied to 2D multi-electrode arrays. And we're just connecting that same data acquisition system to our 3D. That's it. And so the sample that was passed around, I think there was a printed circuit board that provided the interconnects. And then boom, out to the standard system. And uh, that was, that's being supplied by our collaborators, Colin uh, Franz and John Finan. So, so we uh, look for signal quality, noise levels, and uh, spike shapes that are comparable to, similar to the recordings you make with the 2D MEA, but where you might only light up one or two electrodes due to the small contact uh, area. So that's, that's kind of our control, I guess, is we, we take the 2D MEA and, and we see if we observe qualitatively similar signals recorded in 3D. So, so that's what we do, I guess, in principle. These are very tiny signals. I uh, certainly acknowledge that. And you have to w worry about you know, operating in a Faraday cage. You have to have the cable shielded. All, all of that has to, has to happen. Uh, but, but I 
don't believe we're measuring artifacts be because of the similarity in the in the noise levels and the peak shapes, you know, to the to the two DMEA recordings. Yeah. So it's static, it's not moving around. So, so once it's in that 3D geometry as the samples are passed around, the organoid is not moving around and it doesn't have the ability, well the muscle ring does, but that's a whole different thing. That's like a macroscopic motion. That's, that's much easier to measure and we can quantify that by looking, doing optical microscopy and verify that the strains are uh, what we expect. Um, but yeah, it's pre pretty much static. I mean, there may be some thermal fluctuations in the uh, surrounding cell, cell media, something like that, but, but, the, but the organoid itself is not moving and the uh, framework is also likewise not, not moving, it's stationary, yeah, yeah. But to that point, maybe with the neuromuscular junction structure, so, so this is one we have not you know, lit up or, or you know, integrated with, um, I mean, you, you may be making a good, good point in, in this, this context because perhaps your motion of the muscle organoid here could couple to noise in the electrophysiology we're measuring over here. That's possible. I don't know. We haven't gotten there yet. That's, that's a good question. There could be like motion artifacts. But those would be time synchronized to the contraction of the muscle ring, so we could probably you know, subtract those out, I guess, if, if we got to that point. Um, yeah. Other question? Free handouts, <laughs> so I don't know where those are. Uh, 